Welcome to Living Room Worship here at First Baptist Church, Gainesville, Florida. I'm Pastor Eric Spivey, and I'm so glad that you're worshiping with us today. You know, during the month of July, we are working our way through the book of Revelation, both at our Wednesday night live events as well as here in worship. And today, those images of the prophet John are going to guide us to help us to think through how God is at work in our lives and at work in the life of our church and the world. So come, let us worship together. And now, hear these words of our call to worship. Let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. And there shall be no more death, no more sorrow, no crying, and there shall be no more pain, for the formal things have passed away. Behold, I make all things new. Let us worship the Lord. of our God and King, lift up your voice and with us sing, Alleluia, Alleluia, thou burning sun with golden beam, thou silver moon with softer gleam, oh praise him, oh praise him. Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. Let all things their Creator bless and worship Him in humbleness. Oh, pray. Him, Alleluia. Praise, praise the Father, praise the Son, and praise the Spirit, three in one. Oh, praise Him, oh, praise Him. Praise the Son and praise the Spirit, three in one. Oh, praise Him, oh, praise Him. Join me, please, for this morning's invocation as we ask God's blessing and guidance in today's time of worship. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for your mercy and goodness and for watching over us during this time of worldwide pandemic. Keep us safe, Heavenly Father, and we rejoice knowing that you surround us with your goodness, love, and care. Forgive us when we fail you and stray from the path of righteousness you have set before us, and give us strength and courage to overcome the temptations that keep us apart. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for helping us find a way to bring us back together again. Be with Pastor Eric as he brings us a message from your Holy Word. May these words refresh our souls and bring us closer to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. Our scripture lesson this morning comes from the book of Revelation, chapter 5, and I'll be reading verses 1 through 14. Then I saw in the right hand of the one seated on the throne a scroll written on the inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. 
And I began to weep bitterly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. Then I saw between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders a lamb standing as if it had been slaughtered, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into the, all the earth. He went and took the scroll from the right hand of the one who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell before the lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. They sing a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slaughtered, and by your blood you ransomed for God saints from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests serving our God, and they will reign on earth. Then I looked, and I heard the voice of many angels surrounding the throne, and the living creatures and the elders. They numbered myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, singing with full voice. Worthy is the lamb that was slaughtered to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might, and honor and glory and blessing. And then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them singing. To the one seated on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Sing honor, glory to the Lamb, holy, righteous, worthy is the Lamb. Death could not hold him down, for he is upon the throne he is the lamb of god blessing honor glory to the lamb holy righteous worthy is the lamb death could not hold him down for he is risen seated upon the throne he is the lamb of god he is the lamb of god he is the Kids of my generation, we grew up learning many of the basic facts of grammar and science and social studies in the afternoons after school. 
That's when ABC would play the short cartoon videos called Schoolhouse Rock. And one of the most famous of these little cartoons was called I'm Just a Bill. And in this little short video, it explained the powers of government to elementary school age kids like me. I love this song, and I want you to hear a snippet of it. Watch real carefully. I'm just a bill, yes, I'm only a bill, and I'm sitting here on Capitol Hill. Well, it's a long, long journey to the Capitol City. It's a long, long wait while I'm sitting in committee, but I know I'll be a law someday, at least I hope and pray that I will, but today I am still just a bill. That video teaches the balance of powers in our American government system. The powers of the Congress, the powers of the Senate, the powers of the President to veto whatever they pass. You know, power exudes from Washington, D.C., doesn't it? Why don't we call it the seat of power? One of the most powerful places in all the world. That's why American elections get so crazy and dirty and can be so painful for all of us because people are fighting and voting on power, on the power to lead, the power to make decisions, to powerful, to, the power to lead in a certain direction. So here we come to today's reading in Revelation chapter 5 because Revelation chapter 5 teaches us a lesson of God's power in the world. Here's a hint. God's power is the opposite of what we consider powerful and challenges us to reset our understanding of power in our lives, in our church, and in our world. So let's start first by getting reoriented back to the book of Revelation. To understand Revelation chapter 5, let's think about how we interpret the book of Revelation. As I said on Wednesday night, the book of Revelation is sent as a pastoral letter to seven churches in the Roman province of Asia, in modern-day western Turkey. When we read the first three chapters of the book of Revelation, they feel familiar. They're easy for us to, to kind of get our minds around because we've seen other examples of this kind of writing in the New Testament. We can read Paul's letter to the Ephesians or to the Philippians. And so when we read these letters to the churches, that sounds like an easy-to-understand way of what's happening in the book of Revelation. But then we come to Revelation chapter 4. Because in Revelation chapter 4, John begins to describe the vision that he has received from the Lord. Last week I talked about how Revelation is an unveiling and a revealing and uncovering act. And that's what we see here in John's vision. John is unveiling the world of God to us. It's like here is God's world. Here is the world on heaven and um, the world on earth. And John is taking back the veil so that we can no longer be divided, so we can see what's happening on earth as well as in heaven. And he uses this vision to teach those Christians there in the province of Rome, of the province of Asia. The unveiling shows us who Jesus is. And it's a broader version, a broader vision of Jesus than we even see in the Gospels. Remember when Jesus prays in the Gospels for thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven? What John is doing is he's describing a vision and attempting to allow us to see what God's kingdom looks like in heaven so that it can be revealed to us and lived out on earth. And John does the best that he could, can with his human language to describe and to create images to try to help us to see what that vision looks like. So Revelation chapter 4, when this vision begins, begins with a vision of a throne, the throne room of heaven. It's a beautiful and frightening vision filled with unknown creatures worshiping God. You know, John writes his letter during the reign of Emperor Domitian. 
of Rome. Domitian was the most powerful person on earth at that very moment. The Roman throne represented the power that rests upon the emperor's shoulders to dictate the life and the death of thousands and thousands of people. If the emperor wanted to go to war, then that's what they would do. And so the throne room becomes the symbol of earthly power. It's been that way for thousands of years. And so it's no surprise that when John is trying to explain what God's power looks like, he uses a throne room. We see a throne room in heaven as the seat of God's power. And all of those people that are all around him are worshiping the power that sits on the throne. That's what happened in Rome, what happened in other kingdoms. Whoever was around the throne would worship the king. In fact, in Rome, the emperor was considered a god. Emperor worship was one of the things that is happening in the background as John writes this book. There are coins that have been found of the Roman time where we see the emperor, and it just simply says, the son of God. And if you wanted to do business in the Roman Empire, you had to claim your worship of that emperor. If you wanted to do business, if you wanted to go to school, if you wanted to have a society. And what John's doing is he's saying is that it's not Caesar that is Lord, but instead the Lord is Jesus. In fact, that was the very first baptismal confession that Christians would make. As they were baptized, they would confess, Jesus is Lord. My allegiance is not to Rome or to the the throne room of of, uh, this earth, but to the throne room of heaven. So now when we come to Revelation chapter 5, our passage for today, we see that Jesus is being revealed in this throne room, what this power really is. We see the true power on heaven is maybe not what we anticipated. You see, chapter 5 tells us the story that onto this throne room, a scroll appears. And this scroll has seven different seals that have to be opened so that those in heaven and earth can, can, can read them and understand them. But then an angel announces, who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And the amazing thing is here in the throne room that, that symbolizes all of earthly power that no one in heaven or on earth or even under the earth are able to open it. There's no earthly power that's that strong that can open this scroll. It's such a powerful moment for John that when he hears that no one's able to open it, he confesses that he breaks down in tears. I began to weep, he said, bitterly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. No one was worthy. No one was powerful enough. There was no earthly power that was big enough in God's kingdom to reveal what the world needed to hear. And it was into this powerless space that John's vision of power emerges. And what is that vision? A lamb. Here's what John says in verse 6. Then I saw among the thrones and the four living creatures and among the elders a lamb standing as if it had been slaughtered, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. John completely inverts our image of power. Rather than a powerful lion who tears apart his prey, John reveals Jesus as the torn lamb standing as if it had been slaughtered. Instead of that magnificent image of Jesus as the cosmic revelation there in chapter 1, here we see a different side of Jesus, the most powerful side. And this image of this lamb can be a little disconcerting, right? Seven eyes, seven horns. The first thing is to realize is that this was never meant to be pictorially 
described or to or put down. He's not trying to help a, a way for you to describe to, to see it in your head. He wants you to understand what these symbols mean. And for John, the seven eyes represent the Holy Spirit. The seven spirits sent out to heaven. This is, means Jesus it comes as the worthy lamb, full of the Holy Spirit. And the seven horns are signs of power, signifying that Jesus is the power and the power to rule in the world. But it's a different kind of power, right? Jesus, the Lamb of God, full of the Holy Spirit, stands before the throne, ready to rule. However, the power does not come from that strength or that position or that wisdom. The power comes through the sacrifice. Jesus, the Lamb of God, died on the cross during the Jewish Passover, a time when the Jews remembered the sacrifice of the Passover lamb which had delivered the people out of Egypt from death and ultimately out of slavery. Jesus, the Lamb of God, is the one who was worthy to be worshipped. Not because he is all-powerful like a king on a throne. Jesus is worthy as the Lamb of God to be worshipped because of his deep love for us that broke the bonds of sin and death as he died on the cross for you and for me. See, the Lamb of God confronts our worship of power and might. How could this vision of Jesus as the Lamb of God challenge us to see and to use power differently? How does this use of power give us the ability to confront injustice in the world? And when we're being honest, we have to be wary of this earthly power. The world has never and still does not respect this biblical notion of power of Jesus, the Lamb of God, sacrificed for all. From Emperor Domitian to our present day, the world sees the Lamb of God and the power it represents as the slain one as weakness. Many Christians today who claim to love and follow every word of the Bible distrust God's power revealed here and choose instead to fight and organize in order to achieve their own earthly power. And God calls us to do something different, to instead to be instruments of God's power, living lives counter to these earthly values, seeking to be agents of God's kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. In C.S. Lewis's book, children's book, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, the world of Narnia sits under a dark spell of magic by a witch. The armies of Aslan, the lion, and the witch assemble for a final battle at the end of the book. And we assume the power of Aslan, the lion, is going to be enough to break the spell of the witch. Surely, he is strong enough. Aslan, though, knows that might and power will not be enough to destroy the witch. And so in the dead of the night, Aslan, the powerful lion, submits himself to the witch and her army who kill him on the stone table. It's a powerful scene, whether you see it in the movie or in the book. Because at that moment, the earthly power has won. Aslan looks weak and ineffective. The slaughter is complete. Then early the next morning, Aslan rises. The deep magic has been defeated. The true battle has been won. And in the movie version, Aslan tells Susan and Lucy, the two children, if the witch knew the true meaning of sacrifice, 
She might have interpreted the deep magic differently. That when a willing victim who has committed no treachery is killed in a traitor's stead, the stone table will crack and even death itself will turn backwards. This is the power of Jesus as the Lamb of God. And this is the power that Jesus offers us today. This is the power that will defeat fear in your life. This is the power that will overcome adversity. This is the power that will overcome injustices. This is the power that will lead to life and joy. It's the power that we celebrate and live by and that we worship. And so today, let us worship with those on heaven and earth as we see in Revelation chapter 5. To the one seated on the throne, John writes, and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever and ever. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thou art worthy, thou art worthy, thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory, glory and honor, glory and honor and power, for thou hast created, hast all things created, thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure A great worship event we've had today. You know, we've had a lot of opportunities just to, to worship Jesus, who is worthy of our worship. Not because he has some might or power that we simply want to grab, but because of his sacrifice, his love for us. And for that, we give, us, we give thanks to God. So I pray that as you continue to live your life in this world, that you will allow that kind of power to be unleashed in your life and the life of your family and broader into our community and church and world as well. I want to leave us with a couple of announcements. First of all, um, we are continuing to do our Wednesday night live in person and live streamed. Um, if you feel comfortable, you're welcome to come here on Wednesday nights at 7 p.m. I'm teaching more about the book of Revelation. We'd we'll love for you to come or watch on live stream and you can interact with me through texting. We'd we'll love for you to do that as well. And then we have a great event. Our Vacation Bible School is coming again, a digital um, virtual experience with that. It will be July 27th through the 31st. Um, every day, Monday through Thursday of that week, um, you can come drive through, bring your kids from 1130 to 1230, and there's going to be an exciting event for you to experience um, with the kids um, at the feel like you're at Vacation Bible School, as well as get some supplies to be able to um, participate each and every day. It's going to be a great time. It's different, but it's still Vacation Bible school i hope that you will tell your family or your friends or your neighbors to come and experience with us you can check our website or our e-newsletter each week for more information with those words of invitation and announcement let me now close us with our benediction and now first baptist church may the lord bless you and keep you may the lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. We go in peace, we go in love. We go with grace and mercy from the Lord above to tell the world.
this very thing that Jesus Christ is Lord and King. Jesus Christ is Lord and King.